section, we're going to talk about how to perform an action on a resource, as opposed to how to perform a CRUD operation on a resource. If you look at the REST specification, it is for representational state transfer. That's what REST stands for, which means that REST is really all about moving state from the client to the service, from the service to the client. We're transferring that state around. So that lends itself to CRUD operations like create the state, read the state, update the state, delete the state. But there are many times on a service where we need to perform other actions, like I want to send an SMS message to a person, uh, for example. So while REST doesn't really have native support for that, many services kind of hack REST, if you will, in order to offer actions to clients. In order to uh, uh, allow an action to be performed on a, a resource, we typically use the HTTP method POST for this, and we append an action with query parameters to the URL path. Now, we talked about POST before and how POST is not typically item potent, according to the HTTP spec, it is not. But again, we're doing this in a cloud environment, and in a cloud environment, all HTTP operations have to be item potent. So if you are implementing an action using the POST method, you do have to do the extra work to make sure that you implement it in an item potent fashion. Um, now this can be easy for certain things, like if I wanna go and get a thumbnail for some photo image, I could do a POST and in the body I can include the full image and then the response can re return back to me a thumbnail image. And if I go and I execute that same thing twice, well, then I'm uploading the same photo, I'm getting back the same thumbnail, and so it's just naturally item potent. But if you're doing a post operation to, let's say, add money to a bank account, you know, or charge, uh, to charge a customer's credit card for something, then you really have to make sure that that's item potent because you don't want to charge a person's credit card more than once for the same thing. Right? That'll really annoy customers in a big way. Uh, so we looked earlier about how the URL path should be structured to talk to a, a resource. You know, you have the collection, the slash, an ID, uh, you know, possibly a sub collection, possibly another ID within the sub collection. For the path, when it regards to actions, you would use something very similar. So it's slash user management, like I showed earlier in the course, slash users is the collection. Then the user ID identifies a resource within the collection. Uh, and we're going to use this with a post operation now, a post method to do an action. And then after we've identified on the URL, the resource that we wish to perform the action to, you then put at the end of the URL slash colon, and then the name of the action. In this example here, I'm using send SMS. This part in black is frequently referred to as the controller. Um, and it's usually a function name that is a verb because this is performing some kind of action. And then you can optionally have in as part of the URL, a question mark and some query parameters, which are effectively the parameters that you're passing into the method. So if you look at the example I have here, I'm doing a post to the user's collection to the identifier Jeffrey, who's in the user's collection, and then the slash colon, I want to send an SMS to Jeffrey. And then for the query parameters, I'm saying the text of the SMS message should be the string hello. And in some programming languages, it's logically the equivalent of going to the user's collection, looking up the Jeffrey uh, entity or item within that collection, and then calling a method on it like send SMS, and then the text argument would be passed in the value of hello. That's logically the equivalent. And this is the pattern that we recommend using for performing actions on resources.